Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everybody. Uh, Wednesday morning, a day after the uh, historic pick of Tim Walls, a day a day you'll tell your your grandchildren about. I'm sure, Matt. A day which will live in infamy. Yes. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it's, it's been a crazy it's been a crazy year, um, and it's another surprise. I mean, I think we kind of knew that the two choices that Kamala Harris had narrowed down. It was between Josh Shapiro and Tim Walls. But look, this is sort of like, do you remember that episode when you and I, who's like, who's Mike Johnson? Nobody, <laughs> never heard of, never right. heard of this guy, Mike Johnson. I mean, two weeks ago, Tim Walls was relatively obscure. I mean, obviously he's been a congressman. He's been a governor. I think he's head of the Democratic Governors Association. Um, but to the average person, even those of us who follow it closely, not all that familiar with them. Josh Shapiro was a national name, had like a 64 percent approval rating in Pennsylvania. Uh, it seemed like Shapiro was the uh, the smart choice and the obvious choice. And yet here we are. Shocking. Well, it uh, I and I was surprised. I definitely, uh, you know, interpreted the signals According to Shapiro, uh, conventionally, the way many other pundits were, I took the initial rally in Philadelphia to be a tell, uh, even though the campaign said don't don't interpret it that way. Uh, and you know, because I was thinking that way, I I wasn't looking at the Sunday interviews as being determinative. I thought perhaps that she'd already made up her mind, and those were kind of like final checkbox things. But the reporting is that those interviews actually made a big difference. And that uh, Mitch Shapiro himself seemed to waver on the job uh, while uh, Harris and Walls really, really clicked. And so uh, just to take that reporting at face value, it suggests that Harris is not swept up by the pundit chatter. You know, she wasn't worried to disappoint, you know, the chattering class and make the surprising pick if she felt it wasn't the right decision for her. That, that That's my takeaway from it. Yeah, and look, I mean, who knows? If you listen to the kind of pro-Harris people, they're going to tell you Shapiro didn't really want the job, and she just clicked and meshed with walls. I mean, there's also certainly insinuation that maybe pressure from the left not to pick Shapiro uh, for various reasons, including the fact that he's Jewish, including the fact that he went hard after... Uh, the kind of anti-Semitic protesters that that could create protests at Chicago at the convention that could possibly cost her Michigan. Um, who knows? And and I I will I will say also um, you know never Trumpers once again never get anything. This is a <laughs> this is a group. Now I know that with never Trumpers there are, there are some never Trumpers who are effectively now Democrats. Um, and then there are never Trumpers who think never Trump means I'm just not going to vote for Trump. But I'd love it if someone tried to woo me, tried to give, throw me a bone. Uh, and I think that a Shapiro pick would have uh, possibly been uh, an olive branch to those of us who are never Trumpers. And I think the Walls pick is in a different direction. Now, look, he is a talented politician, and we'll watch some clips of him in a minute. There's really no denying that he's a talented politician, but I think he's more a nod to the left. He, he's more of a Bernie Sanders, whereas Shapiro maybe is more of a Jewish Obama. Uh, at least that's kind of how it feels today. I well, still why, believe... why would a Jewish Obama be someone who would impress rightly never Trumpers? Well, look, we're talking about Democrats here, right? They're not going to pick Mitt Romney or uh, Paul Ryan or Marco Rubio. Within the, within the context of the Democratic Party, uh, there is a spectrum. And I think that Shapiro is a more moderate uh, on that spectrum. And uh, even though I do know Walls in the past has had some moderate positions, but I think he is generally more left wing. And so it is on the spectrum, Bill. But look, we, as a never Trump conservative, I, it would be unrealistic of me to tell Democrats, hey, pick Marco Rubio. Like that, that's not going to happen. Pick Nikki Haley. That ain't going to happen. But if they wanted to extend an olive branch, I think that Shapiro would have been the way to do it. They don't want to do that. They've decided I, not to do they've decided not to do that. That's okay. It's her pick. It's their party. But clearly I, there's no there's not overtures. I th I think that is 
that is too oversimplified. And, and, I, and I bet, I bet in a few months' time, you're going to come around on walls. I mean, now, now of well, course, I, kn- I, I know he, that Matt I Lewis is not voting for this ticket no matter what. He's going to write in somebody, you know, he's never going to vote for someone who is pro-choice. That would be true for Shapiro or Walls or whoever. But just as you were kind of caught up in some Kamala fever last week, uh, I think the Matt, the Matt Lewis I know who loves real Americans, uh, regular guys you can sit on a bar stool with, ready to go on a hunting expedition, uh, doesn't get caught up in wonk speak. Um, that guy is going to say, you know, Tim Walls, we might disagree on some issues, but that, that that's a real guy. Well, a couple quick points. One, you just noted that last week I was pretty high on Kamala Harris. I was very impressed, thought that it, it, it took a week. It took a week for her to disappoint. Okay, I think this was her first, in my opinion, unforced error. I just think Shapiro would have been a better pick. But the other point I would make is, I don't think Walls is a horrible choice. I mean, it signals we don't care as much about people like you, to me, but that's fine. Um, maybe she's decided, look, Shapiro couldn't deliver Pennsylvania because no vice president can deliver any state. And uh, we're going to excite our base and turn them out. And uh, Walls can, he'll, he'll do well just in the blue wall kind of Rust Belt states, generically speaking, even though he's from Minnesota or he represented Minnesota. I don't think Walls is a horrible pick. I think he has uh, a, a, a charisma. Uh, he's a good speaker. Uh, he's funny. But I will say this, Bill. One thing that does concern me a little bit is, he, again, he came out of nowhere. He's had a hell of a two weeks. He has been amazing in two weeks, but uh, can he keep it up? And uh, have they thoroughly vetted him? I feel like Shapiro, by virtue of having been under the spotlight in a higher profile position longer, um, maybe has has had more experience in that regard. But you tell me. Well, I don't. I don't think either one. Like I'm. I have a certain you know undercurrent of worry that no one has had the full vet. <laughs> So there's, there's still plenty of time for shoes to drop at all these people, including Kamala Harris. Um, uh, so I, I don't think it's right that Shapiro was somehow better vetted than Walls. And in fact, stuff was coming out about Shapiro. More is coming out about Shapiro in the recent days than Walls. Even though, I mean, I saw yesterday, uh, two days ago, the Minnesota GOP a figure was pushing Walls' DUI mugshot from 1995, uh, where apparently uh, he hasn't had a drink since then. Uh, uh, we heard that Shapiro's top aide uh, was dismissed because of sexual harassment, and some people think that uh, Shapiro slow walked it and tried to and went too far to keep it quiet. Now, again, I'm I'm not saying there he wouldn't have a defense of these things. Uh, I imagine these things came up in the interviews, and we haven't read that that was the thing that 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 felled him. Uh, but they all had little things. That you'd have to, I mean, and and we're seeing now the Trump people are hitting walls on his handling of the 2020 uh, riots. Uh, We haven't really heard walls defend himself on that. I mean, I heard, I've read some things about what he said at the time. I haven't heard what he's going to say now. Uh, So we, we, we haven't had a longer process where these things would have had more time to come out and you'd have more time to see how they would respond to those things. So we're all flying a little blind here. Uh, But I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, fully accurate to say that Walt was picked strictly to energize the base and with no uh, mindfulness of persuadable swing uh, in mind. I think that I think they saw Walt as someone who could do both things. Uh, I mean, it's amazing that Walls was energizing the progressive base when, as a congressperson, he did. Uh, get the NRA endorsement. He did endorse the Keystone Pipeline. He signed a letter uh, telling the 2011 Deficit Reduction Super Committee that mandatory spending should be on the table. And that's another word for entitlement spending or Social Security and Medicare. These are things that make progressive activists lose their minds. The, in, in a different context, they could have totally been like, never pick Walls. That guy is a centrist. That guy, I don't care what he did as governor. That shows his true stripes. Uh, but 
And, and, what, and what do they glom onto about Shapiro? I mean, I think I think more of the broader progressive movement focused on this school voucher position uh, than it, than his Israel position because his Israel position actually isn't all that different than any other Democrat in the, in the mix. Although people could focus on what he wrote when he was twenty years old, where he said something uh, you know uh, offensive about Palestinians being too battle minded, um, which I think he which he did you know walk away from um, recently. It's one thing we did get a chance to see him respond to when he kind of he said hey what are you gonna make a video with this i wrote when i was 20 years old um uh so you know waltz is not simply a bernie crat he has d- piled on a pretty impressive progressive record as governor because he had a democratic legislature which Shapiro doesn't have so his parents had to fight a pill for you to get what legis- legislation that he got he's also been in office for a shorter period of time waltz is in his second term Shapiro was in his first i think with with walls you get someone who presents like a regular American, not an ideologue, speaks like a regular person. Even when you're when he's talking about progressive aspects, progressive aspects of his record, like he did with CNN. What do you say about these things that you, you know, spend too much money on this or that? He's like, oh, it's a big. I'm a monster because kids' bellies are full when they get when they go to school to learn. Like, that's a fantastic answer to describe universal school breakfast and lunch. Uh, so uh, I th- I think they feel he plays both ways, uh, and I think uh, this what because what and just and I wrote an article about this yesterday, but I read in the Times this morning that her team told her, look, neither one of these guys helps you uh, in their states. Shapiro's now you're you're you could win this race anyway, no matter who you pick. The poll doesn't give anybody an advantage over anybody else. Pick who you want. That's what the Times reported today. Uh, and so I think it is plausible that this was much more of a governing pick for her than an electoral pick. Uh, and the one thing that Walls has that nobody else uh, had, at, at least in terms of the, the gubernatorial choices are concerned, is Washington experience. And it's pretty common for the Democratic nominee to be somebody without Washington experience. Uh, you know, Barack Obama had half a Senate term. Clinton and Carter weren't in Washington at all. They're just governors. And obviously, Kamala Harris is sitting vice president. And a senator, it's like she has zero Washington experience. But she has very little legislative experience, either at the state or the national level. Like Obama, just half a term. And in and, and her, and her term, it was all it was the entirety of the Trump presidency where you were doing a lot of legislating. Uh, so she could use a wingman. For Congress, and you know Carter, Clinton, Obama all turned to the Senate to get that kind of wingman experience. Now those Senate seats are precious. You do not want to pluck pl- something out of the Senate. At least someone from a purple or red state. You know, even like with Mark Kelly, you know he would be replaced with a Democrat, but there'd be a special in twenty twenty six. If Harris was president, that would be a midterm, which might not go well for Democrats. And so you might lose that seat in, in two years, whereas Kelly keeps that seat till 2028. Uh, and you don't necessarily want to pick, you know, a gray beard, you know, blue state senator when there is some electoral concern here about winning in swing states and having some geographic balance, having some gender balance, having racial balance. Uh, so I think she didn't want to contain herself to you know, non-coastal areas. Uh, and so that limit, so that made the Senate pool, I think, less, less, less appealing. Tim Walls has tw- not just 12 years of House experience, 12 years being a bipartisan figure in the House. So he actually has experience getting through uh, legislation, in, even in the minority, in the House minority. Uh, and doesn't have like a huge bill to his name, but he does have a, a bill that I know Matt Lewis likes, the Stock Act, which bans insider trading uh, for uh, Congress people, although I think you'd probably say it well, we didn't go far enough. Uh, but still got, got through a lot of Congress who didn't want it. Uh, and and a, a Suicide Prevention for Veterans Act. Uh, and he even said when he's running for governor, if, when, even though I'm in the minority, if there's a veterans bill, the Republicans come to me because mm-hmm. I've built up my credibility in that and sometimes they need Democratic help. So like he knows how the place works. And yeah. I, think, I think Harris is going to be going to lean on that if she's in the White, in the White House. It totally. I mean, it might very well work. He, as you noted, he kind of reads like a avuncular, you know, Midwesterner kind of everyman hunts fishes, that kind of thing. Former football or football coach, 
Matt, you got, uh, you got to love football coach. Mil- uh, veteran. So, yeah, it's he's, he's not going to be cast as like an effete cosmopolitan liberal. I do think Democrats, aside from Shapiro, obviously being the governor, very popular go- governor of Pennsylvania. Um, they With Shapiro, I think Harris Shapiro would have had a more of a brand of a generational change as opposed to Walls. Now, I know he's only a little bit older than Kamala Harris, but he reads much older. And uh, so I think they sacrifice a little bit of that next generation thing. And Bill, not only do never Trumpers get screwed, but so does Generation X. Once again, <clears throat> Kamala, I think, is uh, a little bit too old to be Gen X. And Shapiro, I think, would have been right in the wheelhouse. And yet again, we never get our man or woman. <laughs> For whatever reason, the world is conspiring against us. But uh, that's hardly the lead here. Uh, you want to watch a, watch a clip uh, and we can talk about it? I got a sure. few. Although I'm, I'm trying to, um, I just want to, I was, I want to even read you one quote though before you do that, because again, okay. I, I really, I really believe that Matt Lewis is going to come right on, on, on Tim Walls. Um, when he, am I on the right article here? Um, yes, yeah, so when he was pushing the Stock Act, the Insider Trading Act, um, he said, he told the Minnesota uh, Public Radio, this is when he's running for governor, quote, I did get this blowback when people would say, Walls, yeah, he wants to do this stock act thing because he's poor, doesn't have any stock. He's a school teacher type of thing. And they say it half jokingly, but but not jokingly. They're making the point that this guy doesn't get it. I mean, Matt Lewis, author of Filthy Rich Politicians, has to like that Tim Walls is not some fancy pants millionaire, but a salt of the earth former high school teacher and football coach who likes the band insider trading. Yeah, I mean, like I said, he has he has a lot going for him, and I think you know it, he's a throw. He's kind of a throwback to the era when the Democratic Party and liberalism was like a party that had you know labor unions and like construction workers and mechanics and you know what I mean. Like I mean, that's he been, does. I that's what the Bernie people want. Like the I think the Bernie yeah. people have been dying to find somebody who presents like that, and they've often mm. made bad strategic choices in trying to identify those people. And here's something that they didn't, they didn't really identify themselves. Like, he showed up, and they I think they glommed onto him. But, like, that's that's their dream. Uh, yeah. And I think the way the reason why it might work is because like, he's, he's not fully Bernie-crat. He doesn't really come out of the Democratic Socialist movement, but he's, but he's been very comfortable sort of toggling between these different you know factions of the party let me just also make a point too which is to say i think that donald trump has destroyed the republican bench by either you either get pushed out or neutered if you're a republican those are your two choices you're either purged or you're tamed and the democratic party they have a, this amazing bench and, and and two examples you know two of the kind of finalists to be vice president or to be the running mate uh, were Shapiro, who beat Mastriano, this kind of weird, to use it to, co- to coin a phrase or to use the term, weird Republican, um, and Kelly, Mark Kelly in Arizona, who beat uh, Masters, right? <laughs> um, who was also sort of, he's got a Peter Thiel protege, kind of a Blake Masters. He was a kind of a J.D. Vance, but weirder uh, out in Arizona. And so I think that. Um, by virtue of the Republican Party kind of becoming weird and fielding weird candidates, you've seen the rise of a talented bench in the Democratic Party. And then you have people like Tim Walls, who um, I think came out of nowhere pretty much and is obviously elevated. So, well, this is uh, something a lot I, know, of I know we're delaying the, the, the clips here. You know, I've always been very anti ageist, I don't like pushing people out if they're doing a good job. I didn't think I think Nancy Pelosi should have been pushed out. I didn't think Joe Biden should be pushed out until we saw some obvious problems. Uh, But to those who are arguing, hey, we have this great bench, um, you know, give them a chance. I'm not I'm not saying like, you know, they're right. I'm wrong. We should kick Pelosi out a lot earlier. Uh, We shouldn't have an old guy be president in the first place. Uh, But I do think we've had this period where. Democrats have cultivated a good bench, and there's, and there's actually a lot of people who are not just like promising figures who are House backbenchers, but like governors and senators 
yeah. uh, who are kind of rare to go. And so you've, you've had this period and we're like, wow, we have, we have, we have sort of good people. I didn't even know who these people are. <laughs> and, and here we are. Hey, trust me, as a, as a Baltimore Orioles fan, uh, there is an embarrassment of riches. We've, <laughs> we've got minor league players who <laughs> we, can, we don't have room for them. <laughs> that are so good. So I, that's kind of where the Democrats are right now, I think. And look, it is a little ironic because it very well may be that Joe Biden is a transitional figure, is oh, a bridge to the he future. He literally like, is. It's literally yeah. true now. I mean, I mean, of course, the Harris and Walls could lose, but uh, I mean, between Pelosi handing the baton to Jeffries and Biden handing the baton to Harris, um, you are seeing, I think, talented people uh, rise up. Uh, I mean, so I don't, I don't think, I mean, you know, perhaps Biden should have made his decision earlier than he did. Um, but it's all kind of working out. It's all the, the timing of this transition is all working out for Democrats. It, it would seem. It actually could end up working out perfectly and much better than if they had gone according to normal procedure. Um, <clears throat> but that's a different discussion. Before I play this clip, this much ballyhooed anticipated clip. <laughs> I just want to say I'm, I'm supposed to do a TV hit later today, but otherwise I, I'm ready to turn the page. Um, <laughs> I have uh, said my piece about why I think Shapiro was better than Tim Walls. <laughs> and I've written that piece and I've gotten it out of my system. Um, and I will not bring it up again unless or until Kamala Harris loses the presidency because she loses Pennsylvania by a point. If that happens, <laughs> if that happens, I, the second guessing will come. I reserve the right to say, I told you so. And to, uh, you know, dine out on that for a while, but otherwise I'm going to turn the page and let's play the clip. He drove our economy into the ground and make no mistake. Violent crime was up under Donald Trump. That's not even counting the crimes he committed. I think that was the best line of the speech. Um, I think, uh, I mean, it may not be a Walls written line. He, he might deliver the line, uh, but he delivered it well. I, I think Democrats have had a bit of a struggle to flip the script on the crime issue uh, because, you know, it's one of those things that might feel true that crime is up. Uh, and that Trump's a tough law and order guy. Democrats are a bunch of softies, but the data show the opposite. Uh, and so, but how do, how do you how do you get that out there? How do you explain it? And that was a way to ensure that I mean, I've heard that clip repeat on CNN more than the others. Uh, you know, it, it so it it gives the Democrats an opportunity to say, oh wait a wait a second, you might not know this, but crime was actually down and was up on his watch. Yeah, that's the that's the other part. I've, I've heard Democrats try to say, no, it's down, it's way down, it's way down. Um, but no one has really prosecuted the point. Well, uh, yeah, up on his watch. Uh, and uh, you want to argue, well, it's not his fault. It was the pandemic or whatever. Like, fine. Maybe president shouldn't be blamed for the crime rates one way or the other because no one knows where where crime rates come from. But if you're going to play the game, you got to play it both ways. And it, it literally was up on your watch and down now. All right, so here's what Walls had to say about J.D. Vance. Like all regular people I grew up with in the heartland, J.D. studied at Yale, <laughs> had his career funded by Silicon Valley billionaires, and then wrote a bestseller trashing that community. Come on! That's not what middle America is. And I got to tell you, I can't wait to debate the guy. That is if, you, if he's willing to get off the couch and show up. So, <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> so keeping in mind, Bill, that this is a family show, <laughs> would you like to explain to our audience who may not be hip to it why that's funny? You know, I, I, I just saw this morning, or actually I listened to it um, on, on the dog walk uh, on CNN. 
play that clip, kick it, have the anchor kick it to Brian uh, uh, Stelter, as you just did to me to explain it, and he was <laughs> he was unwilling to fully explain it on TV. Luckily, you um, don't have the same you don't have the same high standards of Brian Stelter. <laughs> Look, somebody on X put a fake post. I mean, I obviously fake post, like meant as a joke, with a manufactured excerpt from Hillbilly Elegy uh, <laughs> claiming that he had intercourse with a, with, with a latex glove it, it stuck between two cushions of a couch. And so it's obviously ridiculous. <laughs> it's not something anyone did to say, I want to make sure we really believe this happened. It's, a, it's just like a transparently r- absurd thing that took on a life of its own to the point where the Associated Press did a fact check. No, J.D. Vance did not have sex with the couch. And then the AP pulled the fact check on the ludicrous grounds that they couldn't have definitively proven it wasn't true. Uh, it's the whole thing. It, it's, it's like Spinal Tap. I guess it's a joke that it's like never, it, it, it goes so much farther than you ever thought it could possibly go. Uh, so here's what I don't like about what Waltz did there. I'm not so much of a, a, I'm not so uptight to think he's a bad person for making a joke. Uh, But I think when he said, did you see what I did there? (laughs) That ruins the joke. It's, it's been funny in part because so like Democrats, I think I forget which, if it was like DNC or D triple C, like someone put out a, a statement talking about how uh, JD Vanched couch some phrase in something like so you're not like you're not literally making the joke we're just like slipping in the word couch and things and it's yeah. like not and saying it's totally innocuous like that keeps the joke going if he just said get up off the couch and left it there then I'd be more impressed now, now you, you gave away the fun by acknowledging well, I, that there's a joke out there I'm also not above a good couch joke. Um, I told one on X that uh, I think didn't catch on because it was too old, old fashioned. I said, um, I said that uh, I put in quotes. Um, I thought when he told me he was in Davenport, he meant Iowa. And like, I don't think anybody knows what Davenport means, but <laughs> because it's a anyway, piece of furniture, right? <laughs> three people, three people found it hilarious. <laughs> right, right, right. Like that's, but, he, but even that, like, that is still, even though it's subtle because everyone knows what Davenport is, it's still an, an explicit, explicit furniture-based joke. I think Democrats just, just kept using the word couch in other context <laughs> and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. What, what do you mean? It's actually the couch. That's weird. I'm just, I'm just saying that yeah. you should get him off the couch and debate me. Yeah. I don't know. This is... Um... Is it? Is it? Uh, let's go, Brandon territory. I mean, it's not well, that. It, it, it's exactly what it. it that's, that's the kind of joke that it is. And yeah. It's kind of like a wink, wink, to the extremely online people. There, I was engaging with a guy on on X who thought that this shows that Walls is is too terminally online. I'm like, no, he's making a joke to people who are terminally online. <laughs> but the rest of the folks just won't know what he's talking about, and that that's fine. Um, so I I don't think. I, I don't think this like ruins the walls brand or anything like that. Um, nor do I think it's really the, the, the key part of the speech, but yeah. I think it does show as walls was saying fairly openly, Democrats are having fun. They're having fun again. Now we've been having fun though, for a long time. There was, um, I kept seeing on Twitter that the crowd, well, first let me play this clip before I get to that. This is Josh Shapiro's speech, and the crowd, having fun, comes up with a chant. He doesn't know who he is, and he's not being honest with himself, so he can't be honest with the American people. He can't. I think I do. <laughs> You're chanting 
He's a weirdo. Which means, man, I love you, Philly. Which means, if you're chanting, he's a weirdo, then you heard of my good friend and our next vice president, Tim Wald. Um, there was also a different, a couple times, the crowd was chanting, lock him up. And I saw on Twitter, because I was not watching this live, I saw on Twitter that Kamala Harris and Tim Walls shut that down. Little, so subtly, I was subtly. Well, they, they, they did as, one of these, was, you know. Yeah, I was hoping for more of a, no ma'am, no ma'am. He, he's, he's, he's not yeah, they, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. I was hoping for a little bit of that, and we didn't get that. And, and I thought that the way it was portrayed on X was misrepresented. So let, 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 me, let me just say, let me say, hold on, hold on, hold on. This campaign, our campaign, is not just a fight against Donald Trump. Our campaign, this campaign, is a fight for the future. Uh, I think it's, it's a tricky moment for them. You know, it is... It's a different lock him up than when it happens at a Trump rally because when it, when it happened in 16 with Hillary Clinton or for, I mean, it's usually by Hillary Clinton. It's not like, usually like, like, literally but, but not Joe Biden. Uh, but it, in either case, they haven't been convicted of something. So it reads more like win this election so we can lock them up in a political pr 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 prosecution. You know, it reads differently when he has literally been convicted and the sentencing is next month and the sentence could potentially involve jail time. Not that I think it will, but like it is a, it is allowed for there to be jail time. So for Harris to be like, stop saying that you're saying he shouldn't get a, a tough sentence next month. Um, so I think it's hard for her to be outright, you know, shut up, don't say that, but she is. And I, and I saw, I saw this happen in a previous rally where Harris didn't even do this, didn't even do the hands, just let it fly. Mm -hmm. The hands is new. Um, and I do think she recognizes that this is not, this is not the message we want to put out there. We want to get, we have a message that we really want to focus on. So let's, let's, it, come on guys, let's put this aside without saying it outright, making that the clip, making that the sound bite. Uh, okay. So Donald Trump, of course, is, well, on one hand, I think he's generally freaked out by Kamala, you know, the, the switcheroo. Um, I do think that Trump world is happy that they went with Walls over Shapiro. Um, now, look, that, that, that they may end up re <laughs> sometimes be careful what you wish for, right? Uh, who knows how it will turn out? I do believe that Trump world, generally speaking, sees more of a target rich environment probably with Tim Walls and and Trump was on Fox News while well, he did a phoner this morning and he called in to talk about it and this is what he had to say He's doing what he wants if you look at his record with no walls no security let everybody in he's worse than they are you know nobody knew how radical left she was but he's a smarter version of her if you want to know the truth, he's probably about the same uh, as Bernie Sanders. He's probably more so than Bernie Sanders. She is more so than Bernie Sanders. That's got to be your guide, Bernie Sanders. And that's not a great guide. But uh, this is there's never been a ticket like this. This is a ticket that would want this country go, to go communist immediately, if not sooner. Uh, we want no security. Mm -hmm. We want no anything. He's very heavy into transgender. Anything transgender he thinks is great. And uh, he's not where the country is on anything. Mr. President, you... uh, this is a shocking, let me tell you, this is a shocking pick. And I think it's very insulting to Jewish people. And I think it's very insulting to people that want security. I think it, it's very insulting to anything having to do with making America great again. I mean, I, I mean, it's what I would expect. I mean, it's pretty standard uh, operating practice uh, for Trump. I mean, the, the question is, that do the punches land? We know, the, we know these are the punches. Do they land? Um, it's a, like that in particular, the, 
they're throwing, that's all the spaghetti against the wall. That's everything, every possible attack line. I mean, I mean not every last one, but pretty much all the issue based ones they could put out there. So it suggests they haven't settled on one or a couple. They're still kind of seeing what might have traction. Um, and I, I'm not inclined to think it's going to stick readily because like, he doesn't he doesn't present like a Bernie Sanders. Um, I think that the immigration stuff is going to have diminishing returns because we just did a border crackdown and there are a lot fewer people coming over the border. And so you're not seeing cycle after cycle of stories about cities struggling with managing their their migrant influx. Um, and and Walls will be able to push back pretty effectively. I mean, he is good at defending his record. And so it's not like yeah. it's going to be a vacuum. He will be able to push back. I, yeah, I think I, I would think. But again, we, as we pointed earlier, like we haven't we haven't seen that much in the crucible. We've seen him done a little bit of pushback, and he's been good. But we haven't seen him get, like, like let's see how he get how he handles how did you handle the twenty twenty riots? Like that's going to be I think very his toughest test. Uh, and well, and we'll see me, how he does. Since you um, since you've mentioned it, what from your standpoint, what's the real story on how he handled it, and what's the vulnerability for him? So, and I, 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 I'm not saying I'm the expert on the subject. This is what I understand it to be. Um, remember, George Floyd happened in Minnesota. Right. So it's a pretty searing experience for, for the state and, and, for, and for Minneapolis. Um, the mayor of Minneapolis asked for the National Guard to come out. Um, uh, the mayor said that he made a formal request. Uh, Walt said a couple of things. One, he thought when it was first mentioned, it was done kind of informally, and he didn't believe that it was uh, a firm request at that moment, and so he didn't respond to it right away. Uh, and he said the vast majority of the people in the National Guard, and mind you, Walt served in the National Guard for over 20 years, so it's not like he's being you know, glib about it, at least from my perspective. He said a very tiny number of them actually had riot training. So it wasn't necessarily the right, the right move to throw in a bunch of inexperienced people when it comes to riot control into that environment. And so he didn't do it for three days. I think when he did do it, he like, focused on the people who did have the riot training. Mm. So there was a gap between when the mayor said he wanted them in and them actually going in. Uh, and I believe Walsh said afterwards that, that the situation wasn't handled well, but I don't know enough about like the, exactly the exact words he used and how much he was taking personal responsibility or not. But there's definitely enough in there where you can't say he handled it, you know, without a hitch. So, so there's, there's so that's going to be, I think a challenge for him to kind of explain that succinctly and convincingly. Is that going to be the end of him if he can't? I mean, the thing that happened, it, it's one thing. It happened four years ago. It's not like we've been consumed with riots ever since. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as I well, said to you, Matt, and, and I wrote about a while ago, I think the way to flip the script on this is to be like, you know what? We don't have cities on fire today because we don't have a president that sets the country on fire on a regular basis. You know, yeah. I was dealing with a situation that the president flamed from years of sowing division. Uh, and if I handled it imperfectly, you know, I certainly I, I apologize for that. Uh, but we're in a better place we are today because we have leadership who brings us together and pulls us apart. That's 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 the kind of thing that I, I would do. Um, I've also seen that he um, signed a bill that would give driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants. Correct. I guess you could make an argument for that, but it's it's not going to play well. Uh, it, it it just it sounds uh, very liberal and unwise. <laughs> Um, well, this is, and then what's this, the this deal, guy turned what's, around what's in 2016? What's the deal with uh, tampons and male bathrooms or something? I've, I've been I don't know this one. Okay. I'm assuming it's something you know, gender identity related. Uh, apparently, that's not going to play well. I mean, so this culture stuff. Um, I again, he his brand, his persona, is like Joe Sixpack, but some of the policy stuff. I just can't imagine it playing well where I'm from, at least, and where I live. Well, this is where you know Joe Biden was very skilled at this, at putting a 
regular common regular guy common sense sheen on a progressive position a culturally progressive position and to be like hey you know what it's just not that big a deal we don't we don't have to be in a culture about this stuff we're just trying to accept people for who they are um you know the driver's license thing you know got hillary clinton turned around in knots in 20 in the 20 uh, 2008 primary um you've seen more i don't know how many democratic states do it we have it in massachusetts now um i mean the basic argument for it is we have a lot of undocumented people here and we want them to, to drive on the road safely. Uh, and they don't, you, you, you things you have to do to get a license to learn the rules of the road. Uh, if they're, if they're going to be here and they're going to be working better that they're, that our roads are safe. And so it's better to do it than not do it. Yeah. Um, it's uh, sort of like the whole, let's give needles to drug addicts thing. I mean, you could make an argument that that's, if, if we accept the fact that this is happening, um, that this could cut down on you know transmission of AIDS or or whatever, but like it just sounds so like you you're telling me that you're spending that are my taxpayer dollars are going to this? It just it seems so egregious, especially to to well, it's um, not a taxpayer dollars. It's it's oh, it's costly to provide a driver's license. You get my point. Yeah. You get my point. Well, I, I do get the point. And um, yeah, I, I think it, it is a little tricky in that respect. I'm sure I'll be hit with the question. I'm sure I'll, if, if they have a debate, I'm sure GD Vance will bring that up. Uh, but that is the general response to it. Uh, and uh, I mean, and you, you, I suppose you try to turn the tables and talk about trying to be uh, compassionate. You know, while uh, you guys want to have mass deportation, which would ru- destroy families. These are people who are here, who've been working, who contribute to the economy. Uh, and uh, we want to give them a, 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 a pathway to uh, citizenship so they can be a beer country, contributors to, to the American dream. And you guys want to take 10 million people and throw them, and throw them across the border when they, even when they have done nothing wrong. Uh, that's, that's where I think that debate's going to end up going if, it get, if, if we have debates, which is a, a, not necessarily uh, a given. Well, based on the way the last couple of weeks have gone, if anybody can explain it in a way that sounds commonsensical, it would be Tim Walls. So uh, maybe he can pull it off. Bill, I, I, I do want to say in the spirit of, of, of bipartisanship uh, and reaching across the aisle, I'm, I'm really glad that you agreed to, uh, you know, wear the black polo. We wear it. Just oh, this like is, this is green. This is a dark green. Oh. <laughs> Then I stand corrected. My whole joke, my whole joke's I don't, fine. I don't have a, I don't, I don't have one. I don't, I don't have any polo shirts. This is not, it's not a polo polo. Well, it's um, not a polo polo, but aren't, aren't these colloquially called, it's sort of like Xerox. Xerox is technically a company, but if you make a copy, we call it a Xerox. Isn't this look, called Matt, a polo? I'm not some country club guy with a, <laughs> with a walk-in closet full of polo shirts and eyes I, I shop at Old Navy and, and Marshalls, like regular American, and sometimes even thrift stores, because I'm, I'm a regular American. And for those who may be watching who think I need to uh, get my eyes checked or that I may be a color blindness, uh, our quality of video is not <laughs> what you would call superb uh, as we record this. So it, it, it let's put it to you this way. Uh, how might we describe it with it? it um, it presented as black, as black <laughs> in the spirit of this conversation, uh, yes. even though it may be green. Um, let me ask you a question, Matt. Do you think there are going to be debates? I do. I do think there will be debates. I think there's going to be another presidential debate, and I think there's going to be a vice presidential debate. That's my gut. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not convinced yet. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to say like there won't be, but. Yeah, I was, I was listening to CNN this morning, uh, part of that Brian uh, uh, Stelter interview where he, you know, he thought that there were, that every, everyone has incentive to have a debate. I, I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure everyone does have an incentive to debate. I mean, so long as Kamala is leading, then she does not have an incentive to debate. Uh, and if Trump thinks that the side by side is not as favorable to him as the Biden side by side is maybe he's, I mean, I I think, I think Trump has a natural attraction to being on TV and and being ratings, but I think we were also seeing him struggle uh, to find his opening 
And if he feels like I don't really, I don't really have a beat on this. I don't really quite know how to take this person on. Maybe he's like, you know, what, let's just let's just do the rallies. Rallies are fun. Yeah. Um, well, the first debate I think was obviously incredibly. People say debates don't matter. Well, that one mattered greatly. It was incredibly absolutely. consequential, and I think it turned out to be very valuable and helpful for Democrats. Yes. Um, but having said that, most of these debates are not helpful. For anybody, really. I mean, they're not helpful for the public, in my opinion. We do not get a better... I don't think it helps us make a more informed decision. They tend to be just shows, productions for ratings and whatnot. So I, it will not hurt my feelings if they do not debate, but I still, I'm predicting that they will. Well, this is you know, the argument I made during the Katie hobbs Kerry Lake race in Arizona where Hobbs refused to debate and there, and people said, well, she, that's the de- worst decision of all time. People expect debate. She's going to lose because of this. And of course, she's now the governor of Arizona because uh, most people don't care about debates uh, and don't think they are illuminating. Uh, and, and, they, and they're often not. They're often more just like one more reality TV show uh, and not something that really helps you get a good sense of where these candidates stand. Now, may, maybe this one's a little different because I think there are a lot of people who think I would like to see Kamala Harris in debate because I don't know a lot about it. I want to learn more. Um, and that perhaps puts a certain amount. Of, I mean, generally speaking, we often have debates because people are afraid to be the one to not have the debate. They don't want to be called. They don't want to be pegged as the chicken. Uh, and there is a bias towards debates in the media class. And you don't want to have a bunch of news cycles saying you're the guy who walked out on a debate. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you have a commission on presidential debates uh, that uh, that c- create a tradition of it for the last several elections and they put out the schedule, you know, it's really on you to walk away from that. And so that created a incentive for both parties. Like, let's just let's just do it. You know, I mean, it's probably going to be a draw, but let's just let's just do it and not be yeah. the one to sandbag yeah. it. Now, Trump sandbagged the commission and the RNC sandbagged the commission. So we, we got we got back into a place where I mean, the commission existed, but people weren't prepared to take their proposal as seriously. And that put the onus on the two campaigns when it was still Biden to negotiate their own schedule. And Biden went first saying, let's actually Trump said anytime, anywhere and and Biden bit. Uh, And so you had it. Now we're back to a situation where Trump and Harris have to agree. There's no commission. I mean, maybe they're going to put forth their own schedule now and try, but it's not as baked in that you have to do their debate. They have to negotiate themselves. And I'm, I'm sure they'll talk, but how hard are they going to try? And, and, and to what extent does each candidate feel like, I really have to get to yes on this, because if I don't, the public's going to penalize me if I don't. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, well, Harris might have a bit more incentive not to be the one that walks away from it, um, because she's the one that people probably have the most questions about. Yeah. No, but uh, but she's that, not going to do it on Fox. She's not going to. That, uh, that price is too high. To your point, Bill, Harris has had a pretty great honeymoon. But this is mostly involved her giving rallies and speeches and not doing interviews or right. debating. And so, you know, the stereotype about Kamala Harris until recently was that she was a not a good politician, that she was not a good political athlete. And <clears throat> I think maybe maybe part of the reason she's done so well is that she's been playing to her strengths. At some point, I'm guessing she's going to have to do a sit down interview, whether she does the debate or not. That's going to tell us a lot, I think, about whether the old, the bad old Kamala reemerges. Yeah, I think we're I think we will have a sit down interview, maybe with walls. Uh, I would gather before the convention. Um, I love I love the idea of bringing along walls as a wingman. Yeah, I would I like mean, to bring that, him to my job interviews. Actually, I think that would be quite nice. You have it's pretty, it's pretty typical to do a joint soon after the announcement. I haven't gone back and checked, but I, I think that's pretty common. Um, and they, I think they're they. I mean, I don't think they have a deep relationship, but they seem to be clicking naturally uh, at the front end. Apparently, that's one of the reasons why she picked him. They they have the potential to be a good buddy act. Uh, 
Uh, whereas Trump and Vance, I don't think have this. It, 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 comes, it comes across a little different. You know, you um, could, now that you mention it, you could do a buddy cop movie, right? Kamala the cop. And she's like the um, she's the boss. She's sort of the bureaucrat by the book. She wants to play it by the book. And uh, but she's got this uh, an, o- an, an older cop older than her. She's new, right? She comes in. She transfers in from the city, from the big city into Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. And she's got this grizzled old cop who likes to play by his own rules. <laughs> and at first they clash, right? <laughs> but over time they become like best friends. <laughs> what do you think? I'm getting too old for this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm too old for this. Um, I think I like the buddy cop idea. I think there's something there. Um, we need a good name. Walls this way. What do we call it? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Harrison Walls is a cop show. Harrison that is literally Walls. literally the name of a cop. That's got to be a cop show that was put out by somebody. I love that. And at first, um, he's, yeah, at first he's like skeptical of her coming in uh, to his city, but eventually they, they learn to love and respect <laughs> one another. Um, uh, I wanted to go through a little bit of a, of a tangent here. Um, I, I, one of the clips you played earlier, Waltz talked about how Vance had trashed his community in his best selling book. Mm hmm. Uh, and actually, I've, I'm going to have an article about this uh, tomorrow. I got, I'm, I'm going to finish it up today. I don't think we people have really picked over what J.D. Vance was saying about Appalachia in his pre-senatorial career. And not just in the book, mind you, but before the book. Uh, because uh, uh, he had an article in the National Review in 2014 where he basically argues that um, the best thing you can do for poor Appalachians is to get them out of Appalachia. Uh, that government programs can't fix uh, Appalachia and that uh, people there in eastern Kentucky, uh, their dream is to draw a government check uh, because there's something in the community that's fostering destructive behavior. Uh, like this stuff has not come out. Uh, the the book Hillbilly Elegy. Have you read it, by the way? I have not. No. I mean, I have. It's I have really my, fascinating. I, I did have him on my podcast to talk about it. Oh, really? <laughs> came out. Yeah. Really? He came on my um, podcast. Yeah, and he bashed Trump. <laughs> you have you have you brought back those clips? I've written. Yeah, and I've written. I wrote about it at the Daily Beast when he ran for, and I quoted from it when he ran for the Senate. Yeah. I mean. I, mean, I, 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 I got the book recently at a used book sale for two bucks. Um, so he did so not I, make, he did not make any money off of your, your purchase. No, no, no. no um, royalties. So I've, I've not read a cover to cover. It's not that long, but, but so I've, I've jumped around in it. Uh, it's really fascinating because you would not recognize the person you see today and the person who wrote this book. They're just not, I mean, uh, there are a few threads that connect but not many uh it, this is a much more nuanced book there's a much more of an exploration of trying to navigate different socioeconomic cultures coming out of a very you know harrowing uh, childhood experience uh it leans far harder i mean there's some knocks to you know culturally elite you know yalees and stuff like that but it is there's much more tougher love put to poor appalachians and white working class uh, where he's saying, you know, don't blame Democrats for your mistakes. Uh, don't expect government to fix your problems. You know, you got to you got to look. Uh, I mean, there's even a part where he says that there's a growing white, white, white working class movement that tells you if you're a loser, it's not your it's the government's fault and not your fault. I mean, he uses the word loser. <laughs> um, if if a Democrat said any of these things, <laughs> they would get destroyed. In the Fox News conservative talk radio universe, for looking down on you know, the white working class, um, and now he's playing the whole like I'm one of you, and the Democrats look down on you, and all that 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 kind of stuff. Uh, so just the fact that Waltz mentioned that, I don't I don't think that you know I don't think that landed uh, everything that he said in the speech today. But it says to me like they've done the oppo, they've done the research. If they have a debate, I think he's going to be prepared. 
to quote from stuff like that. Uh, well, this is a good segue. Let me, I want to plug something. My wife, Erin, um, does a lot of work for a nonprofit that provides Narcan uh, to commu- communities, uh, including, you know, obviously Appalachia has been kind of you know, disproportionately hit by the opioid epidemic. And she just launched a new, um, she's launching a podcast that you can check out. Uh, it's called The Poisoning, The Poisoning Pod. Uh, it's available on iTunes, uh, among other places. And uh, there's a Substack. I think it's thepoisoning.substack.com, something like that. But um, check that out because uh, obviously it's an important issue. And I think there's, a, there's definitely a tie-in. Uh, to what Vance is writing about. Interesting. Yeah, always a pleasure, Bill. Share. Um, I'm glad we got back in the mix, and I feel better. I don't know if I'm, I'm having walls mania yet, but uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Um, so I uh, know I'm around next week. Uh, week after, I will be at the Different Kind Convention, man. Oh, okay. So you will be our man uh, in the arena providing uh, around-the-clock coverage for the DMZ yeah, Army. I love it. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to, you know, I'm, I'm staying at a, uh, a colleague's uh, sibling's house. I got, I got to figure out how I can do a show because I'm not going to be in my own hotel room or anything. Um, so we'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to work that out. Awesome. Looking forward to that. And uh, we'll see you back here in the DMZ next week. All right. Take care. Thanks.